Hello, uh, my name is Brian Earp. I am a scientist and an ethicist uh, affiliated with the University of Oxford. When I wrote this paper, I was based in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. Uh, in this paper, I tackle a very controversial issue, which is what is sometimes referred to as female genital mutilation. And what's perhaps even more controversial is that in this particular paper, I draw a number of parallels between this practice and what's commonly referred to as male circumcision. Now, when I first began researching these subjects, I saw the two as existing in very different discourses and as dealing with different issues. So they weren't strongly related in my own mind. Um, but as I began to research them, I saw that there are many assumptions that many people have about the nature of both types of practice that sort of artificially separates them in their mind beyond what is justified by the nature and diversity of these practices as they are carried out in different contexts around the world. So for example, one distinction that's often drawn is that what's called FGM, female genital mutilation, is said to have no health benefits, to only cause harm, and to be an attempt to control the sexuality of particularly young girls. Male circumcision is said to be a mild procedure that has nothing to do with controlling sexuality and which has potentially at least some health benefits. Well, actually, all of these distinctions uh, break down and are a little bit more complicated when you investigate them uh, by digging into the literature in anthropology, um, uh, bioethics, medicine, uh, and, and learn more about these practices from the different angles by which they've been analyzed by different researchers. So let's take the issue of health benefits. There's some evidence by Western doctors that removing the foreskin, which is male circumcision, uh, can reduce the risk of some sexually transmitted infections and some other health benefits are sometimes raised. In most contexts, uh, the benefits that are attributed to this surgery are quite mild and they may be counterbalanced by risks. There's a difference of opinion among uh, medical authorities on this issue. American doctors tend to favor circumcision in terms of benefit versus risk. European doctors tend to think that the risks outweigh the benefits. But think about the case of female genital mutilation. It seems obvious that there could be no benefits to this procedure. Well, what most people don't realize is that what we call female genital mutilation refers to a range of interventions that remove potentially different parts of the external female genitalia. And in some societies, this is done in a hospital setting and a, a comparatively small amount of tissue is removed and not necessarily affecting the clitoris. So these more mild forms of female genital cutting, or as they're referred to in these societies, female circumcision, may in fact confer health benefits for the very same reason that male circumcision is supposed to confer health benefits. Namely, if you remove tissue from the body, it can't become infected, nor can it uh, harbor bacteria. When it comes to the female genitalia, interestingly, most people in a Western context see it as obvious that the way to deal with potential hygiene and sexual health issues is to simply use soap and water for washing one's genitalia and to practice safe sex strategies. In the case of male circumcision, at least in the United States, it's seen as com uh, comparatively more reasonable to simply remove the tissue altogether uh, from, uh, from the genitals. So it's actually illegal in uh, Western context to conduct a study by which you could assess whether some health benefit might follow from a minor, more mild form of female genital cutting. Imagine removing the labia of infant girls. This would remove folds of tissue in which bacteria could potentially become trapped. Become trapped. It might host an infection or even a, a, a labial cancer. So it's conceivable anyway that removing routinely the labia from little girls would reduce the risk of some diseases. But in this case, it seems obvious that that would be the wrong way to go in terms of preventing these diseases if there were other ways of achieving this that were less invasive. So on the question of health benefits, the distinction is not as clear as people think. Uh, Western bodies only fund research into the potential health benefits of male circumcision, and it's illegal to fund uh, similar research or to conduct similar research in the case of female circumcision, including minor forms. So we simply don't know that minor forms of female uh, genital cutting don't confer health benefits. Um, with respect to the symbolic meanings, this is a further confusion. Some people think FGM is always designed to control the sexuality of women. What most people don't realize is that this depends very much on the cultural context. In some societies, uh, it's done for reasons other than controlling sexuality, and it's always done in parallel with a ceremony with boys. 
So uh, female genital cutting does not exist in any society done only to girls. It only exists in societies in which there is a parallel and similar uh, intervention or initiation ceremony done to boys. And depending on the type of intervention, the effect for boys or girls can be greater or lesser. Uh, in South Africa, for example, the circumcision ceremony for boys among the Kosa leads to dozens of deaths on a yearly basis because it's done in non-sterilized environments, it's done with uh, by medically untrained practitioners, and quite a lot of tissue is removed, so the chance of infection or uh, penile amputation and death is dramatically increased. In many uh, societies where female genital cutting is practiced alongside the male ritual, in Malaysia, for example, there's something called a suna circumcision, which is a ritual nick. Uh, it's unclear whether even any tissue is removed. It's more of a scraping of the clitoral hood, and after this intervention has occurred, uh, many uh, uh, doctors find it impossible to see any evidence of a morphological change. Now, this is classified by the World Health Organization as female genital mutilation. Why? Because it's a medically unnecessary intervention into the female genitalia prior to an age of consent. So, uh, in this essay, I interrogate the differences based on health benefits and based on symbolic meanings that are typically assumed to create a stark distinction between male and female forms of genital cutting, and I suggest that these distinctions are not as strong as people think. And instead of drawing a distinction based on sex or gender, what I suggest is that non-therapeutic or medically unnecessary alterations to the genitals of an individual should only really be done if they're done under conditions of informed consent. So if you're an adult or an older child and you desire to have part of your genitals removed for whatever reason, maybe because you think it will reduce your risk of certain diseases and you don't want to use condoms, let's say, uh, although to have uh, secure protection against sexually transmitted infections, you need to wear condoms anyway. But let's say that that's your preference. Well, I think that people should be able to modify their bodies as they see fit when they reach an age of understanding, and I raise some arguments in support of that view. When it comes to children, on the other hand, I think it makes more sense to defer decisions that permanently alter for, uh, uh, without a medical requirement, a very private part of the body, and that we should uh, hold this principle regardless of the sex or gender of the child. And that's the main thesis that I advance in this paper. I hope you'll give it a read, and thank you for your time.